Chapter 18 Ship Taken Cruise! The voice reached us as a hiss from the trees. I whirled, expecting the worst, but instead saw Bruce Lunardi hunched over, beckoning to us. I saw the whole thing, he said. We moved toward him, in among a thick screen of ferns and trees that completely shielded us from the aurora. Bruce's lips were unnaturally red in his pale face, his skin greasy with sweat. I looked at his leg and saw that it was still bleeding through the rough bandage he'd torn from his shirt. He looked terrible. Are you all right? I asked him. I was worried about you two, he said. He seemed anxious to explain. When you distracted the cat, I ran until I was sure it wasn't following. Then I stopped and went back a ways to try and find you. How's your leg? Kate asked. She glanced at me, looking worried. It started hurting pretty badly in the night, Bruce said. I'll live. But listen, I should have stayed and helped you fight the cat. I did try to find you, but I didn't want to call out. Then I thought I heard it moving around in the trees again, and it seemed pointless to wander. So I started back for the ship. That was sensible, I said to reassure him. I wondered if he was a bit feverish. Bruce shook his head. I got lost on my way back, even with the compass, and then my leg was slowing me down so I had to rest all the time. But then it was night time, so I waited until first light. Didn't get any sleep. All I heard were things moving around. It was deafening. Eventually dawn came and I found my way back to the beach. He nodded toward the ship. They got here just ahead of me. You were lucky then, I said. Those are spear glasses, men. They have a base on the other side of the island. We spent a very pleasant night there, said Kate. I had the captain's private cabin. Bruce looked at her as if he wasn't sure she was telling stories or not. His face was so bewildered, I felt sorry for him. We got away, but not fast enough, I said. What happened? I was just about to walk out from the trees on this side. I could see some of our crew working on the ship, and then suddenly this other group appears, and they're running and shouting and waving pistols. How many? I asked. Half dozen, maybe more? More, I think. Spearglass led them. They worked pretty fast. I backed up into the trees. The pirates held the crew at gunpoint, tied their hands behind their backs. They marched them inside, the crew in front as hostages and shields. They pulled the gangways up after them. There were a couple of gunshots, Bruce said, looking sick. And then the starboard gangway opened for a second, and one of the pirates, a tall rangy fellow, went rushing out, back into the forest. We saw him, I said. He'll bring the rest. If he was headed back to the pirate village, it would take at least six hours before they returned in full force, unless they brought their airship. I peered through the bamboo at the windows of the starboard lounge, but could see nothing against the sun's glare. I wondered if the pirates had gathered all their hostages in there. We've got to free them, Kate said. Yes, but how is the question, I said. If the pirates spot us, they'll kill us without blinking. We must kill them first, she said fiercely. I looked at her in shock. They tried to kill us, Matt. They killed my grandfather. They'll kill everyone on board. You know they will. She was right. I opened my mouth to speak, but nothing came out. If we can get to the captain's cabin, we can get the ship's gun, Bruce said. I shook my head. It's gone. They took it away the first time they boarded. Then we'll take some of theirs, said Kate. We'll get inside and make some noise. They'll send one man out to investigate. We wait for him. We whack him. Whack him? I said. Yes. Bash him with something very hard, like a frying pan or a lug wrench, right in the skull. She said it with such ferocity, her hands balled into fists, that I winced. He's knocked out, we tie him up, take his pistol, and then go in and surprise the other pirates and shoot them through the hearts. Bruce scratched at his chin and smiled. 
I looked at Kate and shook my head in disgust. Perhaps we could work in a little swordplay first, I suggested. You wouldn't want to cut short your swashbuckling. What's the matter, she said. Are you saying it won't work? Do you have much experience shooting a pistol, I asked. How hard can it be? She made a gun of her thumb and forefinger. Well, I've never fired a gun in my life, I told her. I have, said Bruce, and both Kate and I turned to him in surprise. In a shooting range, he added with a sheepish grin. I was a pretty lousy shot, actually. It's trickier than it looks. I don't know that I'd trust myself to shoot straight in a pinch. Exactly. These men were shooting before they could walk. We'd be dead in a second. My body felt hollow and weak. I'm being honest. I don't think I could shoot a man, even one as bad as Spearglass. I'm not so squeamish, Kate said, and her expression frightened me. There must be other ways, I said. The fact remains, Kate said, that we've got to separate these men from their guns, and I don't see any other way to do that. She's right, said Bruce, about the whacking part at least. If we can lure them out one at a time, maybe we have a chance. Knock them out, tie them up, take away their guns. You're not in much shape to whack anybody, I said. I've got some fight in me. I'm sure you do, but I just don't fancy our chances trading blows with pirates. Your legs chewed up. Don't you worry about that. And remember, I've got a few years on you, he added pointedly. And 30 pounds, I know that, but I'm not about to go playing fisticuffs and pistols with pirates. I'm also the senior member of crew here. I stared at him in amazement. What are you saying, Bruce, that you should take charge? By the books, yes. Well, I don't think we have any books on hand, and besides, you don't know this ship like me. You've sailed on her three days, not three years. I outrank you, it's a fact. Your rank's bought and paid for, I said, my teeth barely parting. This isn't helping, said Kate. I rubbed my forehead hard. They think we're dead in the Hydrium pit, I said. We have surprise on our side. I know every inch of this ship. I've got a spare set of keys in my cabin. I get those, and we can go anywhere. I can open doors, lock them. If we can lure the pirates into certain cabins and bays, we can lock them up. Then we can free the officers and the captain and fly out of here before the other pirates arrive. Ambitious, said Bruce. We'll probably still have to whack a few pirates, Kate said. One or two, if it makes you happy, I told her. But I don't want to squander our surprise. Before we do anything, we need to get aboard and have a look around. We're no use out here. I reckon in about six hours we'll have the whole godforsaken crew of them aboard, and there will be no hope of escape then. Are we agreed? Yes, said Bruce. How do we get on board? Kate asked. Tailfin. The Aurora's stern was close to the water. We stayed buried in the trees off her starboard side and worked our way back until we were directly across from her fins. From here, we were almost out of sight from the passenger windows. We ran. Set into the bottom of the vertical tail fin was a rectangular hatch about six feet off the ground. The landing gear gave me a foothold and I heaved myself up onto the step and tried to open the hatch. To my huge relief, the handle turned and I opened the hatch as smoothly and quietly as I could. I took a quick peek inside, then climbed in. Inside the narrow tail fin, I crouched on the metal catwalk, waiting for my breathing to calm. I listened. All was still. I turned back to the hatch, nodded, then reached down and helped Kate scramble up. All right? I asked Bruce. Yep, he said through tight lips. He used his good leg to get his footing and then pulled himself up. I helped him in. He was wincing. I didn't like the look of his leg at all. The bandage was sodden with blood. We were all inside. I slid the hatch silently shut. Light came from three portholes and from an electric lamp overhead. Oh, it was good to be aboard her again, even under these terrible circumstances. Just the feel of her around me cheered my heart. 
The ship's auxiliary control room was built right inside the bottom of the tail fin. If there was ever a breakdown in the main control car, the Aurora could be flown from back here. My eyes moved across all the rudimentary instruments and silent control panels arranged on either side of the cramped walkway. There was the elevator wheel and the rudder wheel. A gyro compass was positioned above the rudder, and there was an altimeter beside the elevator wheel. Ignition buttons, throttles, there was the ballast board with gauges telling you how much water you had and in which tanks. Over to one side was the gas board telling you how full each of the 26 gas cells was. I peered up at them. The ship was 99% full in all her cells. She was airtight and sound. Bruce's breathing was coming quick and fast. Let's take a look at that wound, Kate said. Bruce just shook his head. Come on, said Kate. I won't swoon. He unwound the bandage. Silently, I sucked back air. It looked terrible. The cloud cat had raked his left calf with its claws and clamped its teeth around his ankle, sure enough. It was all red and inflamed and, more worrying, yellow from pus. We need some disinfectant for that, I said, and fresh bandages. I'll try to get into the infirmary. Shouldn't I come as well? Kate asked, and the look on her face was that of a small child, afraid to be left alone at night. I'll be faster alone, safer too. I want to find out where the pirates are, where they've got everyone. You two stay here. What if someone comes? Get out the hatch and back into the trees, all right? What about you, if something happens to you? Nothing's going to happen to me. I know every inch of this ship. She'll hide me. I'll be fast. Lighter than air, Kate said. Is that right? Lighter than air. She grabbed my hand and held it so tight for a moment I winced. It'll be fine, I said. We'll all be fine. Check the lockers down here. See what you can find. Maybe some rope and things for gagging them and tying them up. It made me feel queasy to even think of what we must do. Good luck, Matt, said Bruce. Even now I felt a pang of jealousy leaving them alone together, but I could still feel the imprint of Kate's hand upon mine. There was only one way out of the tail fin, and that was a tall ladder that angled steeply up to the keel catwalk. I took it silently, and before my head came level with the corridor, I stopped and listened. I pressed my ear to the metal and waited for vibrations. There were none. I tipped my eyes over the rim and looked. The keel catwalk stretched forward, lit overhead by electric lamps. It was clear. I climbed up and started running. My bare feet made no noise. I kept my head cocked, listening, breathing silently. I liked being alone. No one's eyes on me, expecting me to make things right. Just me and the ship. The Aurora's intricate anatomy scrolled before my mind's eye. I knew every passageway, every hatchway, every crawlspace and vent. Quickly, I made my way to the crew quarters. I put my ear to the door of my cabin and listened before opening it and slipping inside. My keys hung from a hook by the mirror. I pocketed them. For a moment, I didn't want to leave. It was my room. I looked at my bunk. Part of me wanted to crawl into it and pull the covers over my head and sleep and pretend that everything was all right. On the wall by my pillow were the pictures of my mother and sisters and father. I'll be fine, I told myself. Running again, forward along the catwalk. If I kept going, I'd end up at the door to the passenger quarters. There might be a pirate station there, since it was near the exit gangways. How was I to get to A-deck? I had a hunch that Spearglass would assemble everyone in the starboard lounge. It was the biggest reception room on board, and it made sense to keep all his hostages in one place where he could guard them most easily. I paused and thought. I couldn't risk creeping around aid deck, but I could spy down on it from the roof. I'd need to get on top of the passenger quarters, and the only way to get to it was from overhead. I hurried along to one of the ladders leading up to the axial catwalk. Up I went, wary. Even with the sun high in the sky, it was shadowy along the catwalk. 
Though the outer skin of the ship gave off a luminous moonlight glow, its silver surface reflecting the sun. Axial catwalk. Clear. I stopped at a supply locker, took a harness and a coil of rope, and slung it over my shoulder. Forward I went, the walls of the gas cells puckering and sighing all around me. I stopped. I was now directly over a deck. Far below me I could see the ceiling. I tied one end of my line to the side of the catwalk and gingerly climbed over the railing in my harness. Like a spider, I dropped, straight down, spinning out my line as I went. Down through the shimmering mango-scented canyon. Gently, I touched down on the roof of a deck. The bottoms of the gas cells hung only a few feet above, and I had to get down on my knees to move about. Any loud noise might be heard below. I figured I was over the gymnasium. Not likely anyone was exercising right now. I shrugged myself clear of the harness. It did make me feel claustrophobic, the hydrium bags hovering above me, rustling against my back as I crawled beneath them. Silver ventilation ducts formed a network on the roof, carrying fresh air through the passenger quarters. High in the wall of every lounge and cabin were narrow, slit-like grills. I could see through them if I could get inside the ducts. They were large, but it would still be a tight squeeze and slither. I found an access panel and unscrewed the wing nuts. A gust of air wafted out as I set the metal panel aside. The opening was no bigger than the hole of a kayak. I would have to go in head first. There would be no turning around once I was inside. I gazed out over the maze of ducts and plotted my course ahead of time, for I knew it would be easy to lose my bearings. I slid my body in. I did not like it inside there. It was dark, though at least not airless. The whole purpose of the ducts was to circulate fresh air. I slouched along, pulling myself forward on my elbows and forearms. My poor, bruised and battered toes were sticky with sweat and dry blood, but they gave me good purchase and pushed me through the ducts. One tight turn to the left nearly dislocated my spine. I took care not to dig in with my knees or elbows for fear of making the metal dimple and pop. I could hear voices and knew I was close to the starboard lounge. I took a turn to the right and the duct stretched ahead, light shafting in through all the slit-like vents on its left wall. I slithered to the first one and peered out. The opening was narrow, but when I moved my head, the view it gave me was quite broad. The lounge was crammed with passengers and crew. The women and elderly were sitting in chairs, and the rest were on the floor. Hardly a square foot of carpet was unoccupied. Every single one of our passengers must have been there. I caught sight of Miss Simpkins in a wicker chair, one hand pressed tragically to her temple, the other fanning herself. Near her feet was the mustached cigar man, who'd complained about his antique furniture being shifted. Like the other passengers, he was silent, though he looked as if he wasn't too far off having a go at complaining. I hoped he had the sense to keep his mouth shut. Pirates strolled among them, their pistols tight in their fists. The Aurora's officers and crew had their hands tethered and were lined up together against the outer wall, beneath the windows. I saw Mr. Radu and Mr. Torbay, and there was Mr. Lisbon, our chief steward, Mr. Vlad, our chef, and not far from him, Captain Walken. They didn't look like themselves. It was like gazing at portrait paintings that were all slightly the wrong color and shape. I searched for Baz and found him slumped against the wall with Dr. Halliday at his side. Baz's arm was in a makeshift sling, and a bloody bandage was wrapped around his shoulder. I remembered Bruce saying he'd heard gunshots. These wretches had shot Baz. I felt a great fist of grief in my throat. He's in some pain. Dr. Halliday told one of the pirates. At least let me get some medicine from the infirmary. No. This is inhumane. Just hope there's no worse to come. I apologize, doctor, said Spearglass, coming into view. 
but I can't spare a man to escort you to the infirmary right now. When the rest of my crew arrives, of course, we'll let you. But for now, I need all my men to tend to you here. He said it with a smile, as though this was a perfectly reasonable, and he was simply asking for our help in doing his work. I started counting pirates. A gaunt fellow with a pockmarked face and a blunderbuss in his fist. A second fellow who must have fancied himself something of a gangster dandy with greased hair and a carbine. There was Rhino Hand, the one-handed fellow, his thick finger barely fitting through the trigger loop of his pistol. The sight of all these guns took something out of me, I had to admit, all that deadly greased metal. Six pirates, I counted, plus spear glass, and the great root Crumlin made eight. Eight pirates. I hoped there was no more lurking on board. I looked back at Captain Walken. He must know that these men were not planning on sparing them. But what could he do? Any attempt to overpower the pirates would mean people getting shot. It was not as if he had any chance to devise a plan anyway. The pirates kept circulating among them, giving a kick to anyone who seemed to be talking. There would be no secret plans. I saw Spearglass give a nod to Crumlin, and they disappeared, headed for the kitchen. I wiggled along the vents, wanting to know what they were up to. I heard their voices tinny through the ducts. Silently, I wiggled closer and pressed my face to the grill. The kitchen was small, and I could only see the back of Spearglass. Hazlitt's fast. He'll have reached them in ninety minutes or so. Three hours, and we'll have the rest of the crew here. It was as I'd feared, only worse. The rest of Spearglass's crew were coming, but faster than I'd reckoned. They weren't all the way back at the village. They must have been searching another nearby part of the island. Spearglass said something too low for me to hear. Why not keep her? Crumlin asked. She's of no use to us, came Spearglass's voice. She's big and fat and slow, and we'd be inviting a capture if we dared to sail her. Seems a shame to scuttle her. Ah, but she's a treasure trove of parts. Her engines, Aruba fuel, wiring. We'll strip anything of use from her beforehand. And the passengers? They'll stay with the ship, of course. We'll send her up, bled of hydrium, and a flame. Lock them in the passenger quarters for good measure. They'll not be able to reach the controls. In any event, we'll shoot the crew. My mouth was so dry I couldn't swallow. How could he talk of such terrible things in so calm a voice? A panicky hot flush seared my back and arms. Now let's go tend our flock, Spearglass told Crumlin. It might be an idea to shoot someone else before long. Keep them meek and obedient. Walken's no fool. He'll know there's no merciful ending to this. I don't want any crazed escape attempts. Very good, sir. And get that chef of theirs in here. Our lads may as well enjoy some fine dining while we wait. Their voices faded, and I was left lying in the duct, sick and weak with fear. Then I moved, fast, trying to remember the way back to the access panel. I was afraid my fearful heartbeat would hammer an anthem through the vents of the entire ship. We had not much time. Out of the ducts and onto the roof of A-deck again. For a moment, I forced myself to be still and think above my mind's noise. Bruce needed medicine. The infirmary was on B-deck. I crawled along the roof until I came to the edge and looked down. Thirty feet below me was the keel catwalk. I could see no one patrolling it, so I scuttled down through the bracing wires and alumiron struts. I padded along the catwalk to the door of the passenger quarters. I put my ear to it and listened, unlocked it with my keys, and slipped inside. I was in the Aurora's entrance lobby at the base of the grand staircase, which led up to A-deck. I hurried past it and through the deserted corridors of B-deck, past the staterooms and lounges, toward the infirmary. I unlocked the door and was inside. Daylight flooded into the room from the row of windows set into the floor. I swiped two rolls of bandages from the shelf, a bottle of peroxide to clean the wound, and pocketed a tube of antiseptic ointment. 
I knew Bruce was in a great deal of pain, and he needed something to dull it at least. He needed to be strong as possible for what was to come. I went to the medicine cabinet, but the glass door was locked, and that was one key I did not have. From the linen rack, I grabbed a towel and wrapped it thickly around my fist. I hoped it wouldn't be too loud. I took a breath and smacked hard at the glass. It took two tries for me to get it right, and then the glass splintered and big shards fell rattling inside the cabinet. I paused, listening, praying no one had heard. My eyes quickly drifted across the rows of bottles. I spotted the aspirin powder, and as I was taking it, saw a slender flask filled with dark liquid. I read the label and decided to take that too. I knotted up all my things in a clean towel and listened at the infirmary door before I opened it. Back down the corridor, through the door, onto the keel catwalk, and once I saw the coast was clear, I ran, taking great weightless strides toward the ship's stern. I soared past one of the ladder shafts leading to the axial catwalk, and my stride faltered. I stopped. My skin crawled. Fearfully, I turned and peered back up at the caged ladder. Some vigilant part of my brain had sounded an alarm as I'd hurried past, but there was nothing there, nothing at all. I was sure of it. If there had been someone on that ladder, I'd have seen him. But I hurried on, faster than before, to the ship's stern. Before I went down the ladder to the fin, I paused and took a good long look around to make sure I wasn't being watched. Then down I went, whispering, It's me, Matt! So they wouldn't panic when they heard feet on the rungs. Kate and Bruce both smiled when they saw me. Let's get that leg of yours sorted out, I said. There was no glass of water to mix the aspirin powder in, so I had Bruce stick out his tongue and shook a good dose onto it. He grimaced as he swallowed it down, for it was bitter stuff. Gingerly, I started unwinding the makeshift bandage, talking as I worked, telling them all I had learned. Eight of them, I said, including Crumlin and Spearglass. This'll likely hurt, I said to Bruce, so hold your tongue if you can. I poured half the bottle of peroxide over the livid gash, and it fizzed mightily as it cleaned out the wound. I could feel Bruce's entire body clench, but he made no sound but a low grunt. It was an ugly wound, no question. Just looking at it, you knew it was gouged by the jaws of an animal, for it was ragged and deep. That needs sewing up, said Kate. It won't close like that. I noticed she looked at the wound without any sign of squeamishness. She regarded it much the same way she beheld the bones of the cloud cat, with keen interest. No, I said, it's best left open if it can, so it can drain. Don't want to trap the infection inside. Kate looked at me impressed. Is there anything you can't do, Mr. Cruz? She asked. Can't sing, I said. Really? Not worth a spit. It's a terrible sound I make. Now listen, I said, dabbing Bruce's wound dry with a clean towel. The rest of the pirates will be here soon. I hear Spearglass and Crumlin talking. They're going to gut the ship, then kill all the crew, and send her out to crash. We've got three hours before they arrive. I squeezed great globs of the antiseptic ointment into the wound, and then, with Kate's help, started wrapping it up in the fresh bandages, not too tightly. Thank you, said Bruce as we tied it off. That feels much better. The aspirin should kick in soon, I told him. We sat in silence for a moment. Three hours, I said again. Well, are we all ready to whack some pirates? Kate said. We'd better get cracking, said Bruce, trying to sound decisive, but his mouth was dry. I took a look around the narrow room, the rudder and elevator wheels, the levers and navigation instruments and control boards, all quiet and dark now, but ready to come alive. I said, we could fly her. What are you talking about? Bruce said, the ship. We could fly the ship. Nothing fancy. Take it up so the other pirates can't come aboard and then we can set about freeing everyone. Too risky, said Bruce. We can't take off without the captain and crew. We can't afford to wait for them. We're just three people. It can't be done, Cruz. It can be done. I've had two years at the academy, said Bruce, and there is no way I can launch the ship. 
I can do it, I said. No. I've spent more hours in the control car than some of the officers. I've watched everything. I know how they do it. I can do it. He can do it, Kate said to Bruce. We both turned to her, and I didn't know when someone's words had made me feel so buoyed up. You don't know what you're talking about, said Bruce. I have absolutely no doubt he can do it, she said again. Matt can fly the ship. With your help, I said to them. It has to be done, Bruce. We get her up and clear, and we only have eight pirates to deal with. We wait until we have twenty, and that's the end of it. That's the end of everything. He's right, said Kate. How do you propose we do this? Bruce demanded. We need to start casting off lines. Do you know how many lines she's got on her right now? He said, incredulous. Of course I do. She carries twenty landing lines on each side, and each one of those splits into five spider lines. That's two hundred lines plus whatever extra we put on her. Exactly. We need a ground crew of hundreds to launch her properly. We landed her without a ground crew. I know it's dangerous. I hurried on before he could cut me off. I'm not saying it isn't, but we're in luck. There's not a breath of wind right now. We cast off the port and starboard lines first. The bow and stern lines will be enough to hold her snug until we're ready to launch. We'll slip the stern line last, dump ballast, and go. The moment the engines come on, they'll know we're here. They'll go to the control car first. Fine, but then they'll come running straight here. We won't be here by then. No? No, we'll be hiding, and they'll be dopey. Dopey? said Bruce. I lifted the flask I'd taken from the infirmary and showed it to Kate. Is this the same as Miss Simpkins was taking? She smiled slowly and gave a nod. Your devious little mind has given me an idea, I said. The pirates are hungry. They've got Vlad in the kitchen cooking for them. He'll make them a proper meal, better than the slop they serve themselves. If I can get this to him, he can dump it in the food. He's on A deck, Ruth said. How are you going to get past all the pirates? There's no one on B deck. I can get into the kitchen down there and take the dumbwaiter. It's tiny. I can be tiny. He looked at me then chuckled, shaking his head. You're a madman. How fast does this stuff work? I asked Kate. I don't really know. Quite quickly, I think. But Marjorie never needed much help falling asleep. All she needed was a few drops. They're getting all of it, I said. Well, that should do nicely. Bruce nodded. If it works fast enough, all we have to do is wait for them to drop, tie them up, and free the crew. It seemed too much to hope for. I'll need someone to go with me and work the dumbwaiter. There were no controls inside. I'll come, said Kate. Good. Bruce, do you think you can start casting off? Slowly he stood, testing his leg. It's not really 200 lines, he said. If we just slip the main landing lines from the hull, that makes only 40. Safer this way than messing about with the moorings on the beach. They might spot us from the windows. You're right, I said. We'll do the lines forward of the passenger quarters. You take care of the ones aft. Is that all right? I felt badly for him and his leg torn up and blazing with pain. Roos nodded. What about the bow line? I'll take care of that too. Leave the stern line on until we're all back here. Let's do it, he said. For just a moment, the whole enterprise seemed insane. But it was our only hope, and there was no going back now. Take off your shoes and boots, I told them. You'll be quieter. My feet might be a bit whiffy, Kate said apologetically. I promise not to sniff them. She unlaced her boots quickly while I helped Bruce off with his shoes. Then I led the way up the ladder to the keel catwalk. I could smell fish wafting down the corridor. Vlad was already cooking. We had to hurry. It took Bruce quite a while to make it up the ladder. I wondered if he was up to this. On the keel catwalk, we parted company. Kate and I wished Bruce luck, and he limped off down a lateral walkway to the ship's starboard hull. There were access hatches all along that would let him get to the main landing lines and slip them from their cleats. Kate and I padded our way forward. We were amidships when we heard voices and froze my senses swiveling to find the source. They were coming from just behind us, 
from the gangway that led to the aft engine car. The footfalls were getting louder. They'd come out onto the keel catwalk soon, right behind us. There was no time for running back. Run forward and they might see us before we could get out of sight. Slide under, I hissed at Kate, pointing down. There was a bit of clearance between the metal grill of the catwalk floor and the actual hull of the ship's belly. I pulled her down and helped her swing her legs under the catwalk. I shoved her body beneath, then slid in beside her. It was dark, but there was a tungsten lamp not too far along the corridor, and if anyone was to look directly down, he would see us stiff and frozen like fossils in a glacier. The voices grew louder. They're beauties, said one of the pirates, better than ours. Three thousand horsepower each, I'd wager. Spearglass says we can take three and leave one aboard to power up and wreck her. There were two of them, Crumlin and some other fellow. I could see them as they emerged from the gangway and came toward us along the keel catwalk. They talked about the engines and the best way to strip them. I felt their footfalls through the metal of the catwalk, through the wall of my chest into my heart. I tried not to breathe. Their boots clanged over us and stopped just over our heads. I was staring up at the pockmarked undersides of their boots. I could tickle the underside of their boots if I but lifted my finger. I could see up their trouser legs and behold their great hairy calves. The smell was not pleasant. That cook's got something on the go, said the pirate. Hungry, are you? Crumlin asked. I'll wager their grubs better than ours. Maybe we should keep the cook. They both laughed at this. Crumlin lit a cigarette and dropped the match. It fell through the metal grill and landed on my cheek, its tip still blazing hot. I screwed up my face and tried to think of my foot, my fingers, anything but the red-hot ember on my flesh. Water flooded my eyes, my nostrils ran. The heat faded. I needed air. I wanted to breathe deeply. But the wretches were still standing over us, gabbing about what else they wanted to strip from the ship. Some cigarette ash drifted down onto Kate's nose. She breathed some of it in, and I saw her nostrils wrinkle, and knew she was about to sneeze. Her eyes narrowed, her chest quivered. I lifted my hand and pinched her nose with my fingers. She gave a little gasp, but at that moment the pirates started walking again, and their boots clanged on the catwalk, blotting out the sound. Crumlin and his friend kept going. I listened to their fading footsteps, following them forward through the ship. Keys jangled, a door opened and closed, and I knew they'd passed into the passenger quarters. We crawled out. I was shaken, not just by our close call, but by the fact the pirates were moving about the ship now. I'd become careless, assuming the pirates were still all in A-deck, standing guard over their hostages. It would make it harder for us to get around to stay secret. I hoped Bruce was being careful. Are you all right? She said, touching my cheek. There must have been a red mark there. I could still feel it smarting. The pads of her fingers were cool and soothing. Fine, I told her. The smell of Vlad's cooking suffused the corridor, and my stomach tightened with hunger. It smelled awfully good. We made our way, more carefully now, to the door to the passenger quarters. The pirates had locked it behind them. I listened, then led us through onto B-deck. I led Kate past the crew's mess to the kitchen. Overhead I could hear footsteps and the faint sounds of Vlad singing and cursing as he cooked in the main A-deck kitchen. I walked over to the dumbwaiter and slid open the door. We looked at it. You can't fit in there, Kate said. I can, I said doubtfully. It was even tinier than I'd remembered. Maybe I should do it, Kate said. I'm smaller. No. In you go then, she said. I handed her the flask of sleeping elixir. I had to go in backward, for once I was in, there would be no shifting and certainly no turning around. I backed in bum first, spine and neck bent until I could barely breathe, my knees splayed up onto either side of my ears. I felt like a circus freak, squeezing into a milk crate. All right? Kate asked. 
I grunted. There will be bits still sticking out, she said, and gave me a good shove. Gently does it, I hissed. Sorry, here. She placed the flask in my fingers and jammed in my right foot, which kept sliding out. Don't want to get in caught in the door. Ready? Ready. I was boxed. I would rather have swung over the open ocean than this. Sweat prickled across my entire body. Kate slid the door shut, and I wondered if my heart would stop. Thank goodness for the little round window, at least. Kate peered in at me, smiled, then her hand lifted to the control buttons. With a jerk, I was moving up. Blackness slid down over the window. It was only a matter of ten feet, I knew, but those were the slowest ten feet I could recall. The noise of the dumbwaiter's motor sounded labored, and I wondered if it had ever carried such weight before. I was light, but not lighter than a rack of lamb. Good lord, what if there were pirates in the kitchen with Vlad? What if they were standing guard over him? I'd be delivered to them trussed up like a Christmas goose. Light bobbed down behind the window, and I was in the upper kitchen. Steaming pots and spitting skillets and vegetables and fish and potatoes were spread out on cutting boards. And there was Vlad, his back to me, whisking something in an enormous soup pot. I tilted my head as much as I could, but saw no one else in the kitchen. I waited a moment for Vlad to turn. I'd been hoping he would hear the dumbwaiter and turn in curiosity, if nothing else, but the sounds of his kitchen must have drowned it out. I could not open the door from the inside. I rapped at the glass with my knuckles. I felt a batwing flutter of panic inside my chest. I was trapped. I knocked harder and could see Vlad stand taller for a moment. Once more I knocked, and this time he turned, frowning. He bent and peeped into the window and jerked in surprise. He looked hurriedly to the kitchen doorway, then opened the dumbwaiter. Yes, Mr. Cruz, he said as if I regularly made an appearance in the dumbwaiter. I've got some... He whirled away from me and went back to the oven. A pirate staggered in, a near-empty bottle of wine in one fist, a pistol in the other. I shrank back into the dumbwaiter. My toes, I was sure, were sticking out. Where's the soup? The pirate warded Vlad. Coming, Vlad bellowed back. A soup you will like. You will adore it. We'd better, or I'll bung you in for more flavor. Ha <laughs> ha, Vlad laughed dementedly. Yes, yes, of course. The pirate was beside Vlad now, peering into the great cauldron of soup, his back to me. We're hungry, Count Dracula, now get a move on, cook. Cook, I live to cook, bellowed Vlad. Let me cook. The pirate turned. His head was now in profile. With one twitch of his eyes, he would see me. He took another long snort from the bottle of wine. He started turning toward me. What is that you're drinking? Vlad said suddenly, placing himself between us. Booze is what it is, the pirate retorted. Vlad took the bottle to read the label. No, 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 shouted Vlad as if impaled on a sword. This is the wrong wine for the meal I am about to serve. Open a white, please, a Chablis or a Resling. The soup will be better, you will see. The pirate pushed him away and stomped out of the kitchen. Vlad turned back to me. Peasants, these people. He thinks a burgundy is appropriate. He shook his head venomously, as if he'd forgotten the fact we were prisoners, our lives were in danger, and I was cramped in a dumbwaiter. Vlad sighed heavily. Now then, what can I do for you, Mr. Cruz? My soup soon is at a critical stage. I wondered if Vlad was completely cuckoo after all. My hopes felt all soggy. I held up the flask of sleeping elixir. He squinted at it, read the label, and nodded. He took it from me. Yes, yes, I see. For extra flavor. He winked at me, and I knew that he understood perfectly. He crammed my foot back inside the dumbwaiter and then, as an afterthought, he filled a bowl of fish soup, popped in a spoon, and pushed it into my hands. Then he closed the dumbwaiter door and pressed the down button. 
My last view through the round window was of Vlad uncorking the medicine bottle and dumping the entire contents into the soup while belting out an opera aria. Down I went. It was no easy feat, eating and swallowing in such a position, but I had devoured half the fish soup before I reached the bottom of the dumbwaiter shaft. I saved the rest for Kate. With a jolt, I stopped. Light filled the round window. Kate was gone!